Fathers of Texas will continue in a moment here on A&E. The bargain Stephen Austin set for his settlers in Texas was unbeatable. A huge grant of free land for all newcomers and a plan to redeem this land from its wilderness state. But in the face of advancing Mexican forces, how would a diplomat rally the strength it would take to keep his people and their way of life truly free? The answer was Sam Houston. The morning of glory is dawning upon us. The work of liberty has begun. Sam Houston, 1835. In the autumn of 1835, Houston would sell 4,000 acres of his Red River land to raise money to buy such necessities as a uniform with a general star on it and a sword and a sash to adorn it. War is raging on the frontiers. The enemy must be driven from our soil or desolation will accompany their march upon us. Independence is declared. It must be maintained. The patriots of Texas are appealed to in behalf of their bleeding country. Sam Houston, March 2nd, 1836. Houston's small volunteer army assembled near San Antonio. And with Santa Ana's troops advancing into Texas, he traced a retreat that would bring the armies face to face at a bio battlefield called San Jacinto. Houston's camp was set up on Buffalo Bayou, and Santa Ana's camp was about a mile away. And they, these two armies were set up there, and Santa Ana's feeling was that he could just pick off the Texans whenever he chose. Houston camped at San Jacinto and slept far into the next morning. Houston held a council of war at noon. According to Houston's account, most of the soldiers didn't want to fight or didn't want to attack. But Houston decided to fight that afternoon, formed his army into a line across the field uh, at San Jacinto uh, at 3.30 in the afternoon of April 21st uh, and advanced on the Mexican position. The rebels advance on the Mexican barricades, screaming like banshees their battle cry, remember the Alamo, remember Goliad. Flustered, disoriented, the Mexicans began to fall back. Uh, first as individuals, but then as entire squads. For 18 minutes, blood and carnage ruled the battlefield at San Jacinto. I sat there on my horse and I shot them until my ammunition gave out. Then I turned the butt end of my musket and started knocking them in the head. Private William Young. The Mexicans fired one volley, most of which went over the heads of the Texans. Oh, well, that's when Houston was here and his horse was hit. The Texans then advanced to maybe 20 yards away. They fired and then charged and broke through. All discipline was at an end. We fired as rapidly as we could. As soon as we had fired, each man reloaded, and he who got his gun ready first moved on without waiting for orders. Private Alfonso Steele, 1836. The Texans are in an absolute killing frenzy of revenge and fall upon many of the Mexican soldados, some of whom beg for their lives, yelling, me no Alamo, me no Goliad. That finds them little mercy. Most of the Mexicans actually fall back into a marsh area, into a lake. By the end of the day, the Peggy Lake is completely crammed full of uh, Mexican bodies, and the waters of Peggy Lake are thoroughly red. They had plunged into the mire and water with horses and mules. Everyone who seemed likely to escape soon received a ball from the murderous aim of a practiced rifleman, and the bayou was literally bridged over with carcasses of dead mules, horses, and men. Sam Houston, 1836. The wounded General Houston rested on the battlefield until a mud-spattered Santa Ana was brought before him, defeated. I was lying on my side in kind of a daze when I felt some person clasp my right hand. I looked up as Santa Ana stood before me. He announced his name and rank. Houston emerged the celebrated hero of San Jacinto and the founder of a new republic that needed a president. In the campaign for the presidency of the new Republic of Texas, 
Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin are both seemingly reluctant candidates, although Houston certainly much less reluctantly than Austin. And Houston wins overwhelmingly. He's the George Washington of Texas. He's the great military hero, and he wins an impressive and important victory. Houston named Stephen Austin Secretary of State but the frail founder of the Texan colonies would not live to harvest the fruits of liberty. Austin had been plagued with ill health all of his adult life. He was a chronic sufferer from malaria, which weakened his entire body. The year in a damp dungeon in Mexico City had further weakened his constitution. And in the closing months of 1836, Austin found himself living in a drafty log cabin under a heavy workload as Secretary of State of the New Republic, and he contracted pneumonia. He didn't even have a bed to lie in. He took to a pallet on the cold, drafty floor and died a couple of days later. On December 29th, 1836, a procession including Sam Houston and many of the original colonists looked on as the paddleship Yellowstone carried Austin's body on its final journey up the Brazos River. A successful military chieftain is hailed with admiration and applause, and monuments perpetuate his fame. But the bloodless pioneer of the wilderness, like the corn and cotton he causes to spring where it never grew before, attracts no notice. No slaughtered thousands or smoking cities attest his devotion to the cause of human happiness, and he is regarded by the mass of the world as a humble instrument to pave the way for others. Stephen Fuller Austin. Austin's work and his new republic were left unfinished, for the dream he shared with Houston was of a Texas conjoined with the United States. Both Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin were dedicated to having Texas become part of the United States once the victory had been won at San Jacinto. But it proved more difficult than they thought. Anti-slavery sentiment in the North blocked annexation. As a result, Houston would finish his first term as president with his proposals to annex Texas to the United States rejected. The 45-year-old hero would briefly retire from public life to pursue, among other interests, a young woman named Margaret. Fathers of Texas will continue in a moment here on Fathers of Texas. It was 1839 the New Republic of Texas would celebrate its third birthday and Sam Houston his 46th. During his brief retirement from public life, Sam would visit Alabama and favor a young woman there with an Italian courtship cameo of himself. The object of the general's affections was 20-year-old Margaret Moffett Lee. Margaret was the woman that Houston had been looking for all of his life. The good woman that all of his friends uh, said that Sam needed to help him settle down. And settle him down, uh, Margaret did. Margaret Moffett Lee succeeded in sobering him up. He'd had a terrible drinking problem, and she did succeed in drying him out. But her greatest crusade, really, to get him to join the, the Baptist Church and to be baptized. She brought a tremendous amount of stability to Sam's life. I think an awful lot of love. Their correspondence is extremely, extremely, I think the right word would be mushy, though not untypical for this period. My ever dear love, I love you so much that I am not happy when you are absent from me. I trust you will be with me soon so that I will reserve the rest for your own private ear. It is much safer to whisper things than write them. If I were to tell you here how much I love you and the letter should be opened by some other person, there would be an awful disclosure. Thine forever, Margaret Lee Houston. Late in life, uh, Houston and Margaret uh, have a number of children. Uh, Houston seems to love his children, be devoted to them. His letters are replete with references to them. My dearest, you have around you many of the pleasures which I so much desire. Thy faithful husband, Houston. 
Among the objects of Houston's pleasure were Nanny, Mary Willie, and Maggie, named for her mother. Like her namesake, Maggie would someday wear the cameo that conveyed Sam's likeness and affection. Settling in Huntsville, Texas, the Houston flock would grow to number eight children, including Sam Jr. and Andrew Jackson Houston, named for his father's military and political mentor. But the fact of the matter is, Sam's first love is politics, and he spends far more time in Washington or Austin than in Huntsville uh, with his children. After two terms as president of the New Republic, Sam Houston saw Texas annexed to the United States in 1845. To make way for the stars and stripes of the Union, the Lone Star flag of Texas was lowered and the Republic of Texas was no more. Sam Houston would continue as senator. Houston served in the Senate from 1846 to 1859. For most of that time, the great question facing the United States was a sectional dispute between the North and the South that eventually broke up the nation and led to civil war. From the beginning of that question, Sam Houston was a unionist, an all or nothing unionist. In 1854, as one of the two US senators from Texas, Houston performed the bravest political act of his career when he voted against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would have potentially opened up certain Western territories to slavery. So he, alone among all U.S. senators from the cotton states, voted against the act. And of course, he was hung in effigy. He was reviled on street corners and on the political stump. The state legislature called upon him to resign in Texas. Although rejected by the Texas legislature, the people remained loyal to Houston and elected him governor in 1859. It was a very special case, and it was a testimonial to Houston's tremendous popularity as a military hero. He became governor in 1859. He was then governor when Lincoln was elected in 1860, and the secession movement began. Houston fought secession in Texas exactly the same way he had fought the San Jacinto campaign against the Mexicans. Hardly had Texas joined the Union when the issue of secession to maintain the right to hold slaves swept the southern states. Houston fought with all of his might against the forces of secession in this Union. But crowds now hooted him down, spat upon him, threatened his life. The man who had given birth to Texas was now hated by the people he had led. He refused to swear allegiance to the Confederacy and was ousted from office. In the weeks and months leading up to him finally being removed as the governor of Texas, when he would go out to public speaking engagements, people actually stood on the side and individuals would chant, kill him, kill him, kill him. Houston is terribly unpopular with the great majority of Texans at this point for having opposed secession. At one point, threats are made against his life, but an old friend, and Houston had hundreds of them in Texas, pulled a revolver and said, I don't agree with what General Houston has done either, but as long as he's Sam Houston, he can speak anywhere on the streets of Texas and his life is safe. Houston retired to Huntsville, Texas, where he lived his last years secluded in a house that looked like a steamboat. By late 1863, his eyesight and health were failing him. He reposed to the front room of the steamboat house where he would receive his last visitors and spend final days with Margaret. As he lay dying in the steamboat house, his final thoughts were of Texas, as were his final words. As Margaret read to him from a prayer book, he gasped out, Texas, Texas, Margaret.